Uh, <clears throat> okay, good afternoon, everybody. First, I would like to thank the organizers for the very interesting uh, school and uh, also the opportunity of this talk. So, okay. So as you see on the screen, I divided my talk into three main parts. First, I would talk about the uh, uh, inflationary models involving non-ability engaged fields. Uh, then I would uh, focus on uh, tensor fluctuations during inflation in the presence of the gauge fields. And eventually, I um, will present a leptogenesis uh, scenario based on uh, inflationary models uh, uh, involving non abelian gauge field, and finally, I would uh, finish by conclusion. The, fir the, the first two parts are actually based on this work. So, we are proud that our <laughs> current measurements of CMB and large scale structure are in great agreement with the concept of inflation, and moreover, cosmic uh, inflation provides a plausible physics, uh, physical mechanism for explaining the origin of the large scale structure. Um, but, you know, uh, despite the observational successes of the inflation paradigm, the nature of the inflationary epoch is still poorly understood. And uh, uh, we hope that the, the next generation of experiments uh, actually uh, answer some uh, fundamental questions about the mechanism behind inflation. So, in fact, the scalar field floral models, uh, although they are the uh, simplest possible models of inflation, maybe not the whole story of the physics behind inflation. So, uh, yeah, maybe this new physics involves some new fields, and in addition to the inflaton fields. And on the other hand, Gale field theories are the widely accepted framework for. Uh, building particle physics models around um, and beyond standard models. So in view of uh, this ever present of, uh, at every energy scales of non uh, actually gauge fields, then uh, that's a natural question to ask what is the role of gauge fields uh, during inflation and in the physics of inflation. So I... Um, in order to actually answer this question, first I would uh, answer these two uh, questions, but of course I don't have enough time to answer, <laughs> answer them. I just briefly go through them. The first one is how to preserve the spatial isotropy in the presence of the gauge fields. Um, because if I have a vector field, of course it would break the, uh, uh, the isotropy of the space. So, this is the first question. The, the, the second question is actually how to break the conformal invariance. So if I have conformal invariance in my system, then the vector fields would uh, dilute and they cannot uh, actually uh, make a sizable contribution in the physics. Uh, I would uh, briefly talk about the first question, but uh, there are uh, some models already in the market that answered the second one, and actually in the context of uh, non-abelian gauge fields, it's uh, actually uh, have been done in gauge inflation model and chromonatural model. So before that, I just uh, want to mention that I'm interested in uh, Einstein GR, uh, gravity minimally coupled fields in four dimension, and we do respect gauge symmetry. So I'm not talking about uh, vector inflation models. And uh, for simplicity, I will uh, set the non-abelian uh, gauge group to be SU2, but uh, it's, the idea is quite general, so you can use any kinds of non-abelian gauge fields. Okay, just... Uh so, uh, if, I'm sorry, is, oh, okay. So, uh, if I start from this uh, general Lagrangian, so uh, GR gravity and this term, which is actually uh, so involves uh, some scalar fields and some non abelian gauge fields, then fortunately in the presence of the non abelian gauge fields, it's possible to uh, have an isotropic and a homogeneous solution 
which is this one. This, this is for scalars are quite trivial, but for the gauge field, we have this solution. So I can set the uh, gauge field in the temporal gauge, and then the solution for the spatial part would be this one. This is the scale factor. vector. Uh, uh, sorry, this is the scale factor, and the psi is a, a somehow effective scale field, uh, which is proportional to uh, delta for later convenient, uh, actually for what I would uh, tell you later, uh, note that the psi is not an actual scalar, but it's a pseudo scalar. And then when I, uh, when I would talk about the tensor perturbation, we will see that uh, uh, the pseudo scalar would lead to some parity add uh, interactions in the tensor perturbation um, uh, action. So uh, uh, because I don't want to talk about any specific model. Let's uh, consider these general actions. There are some scalar fields and some uh, gauge field uh, interactions here. And uh, in this setup, uh, if you study the uh, tensor, uh, you study the cosmic perturbations. Uh, there are some interesting. Uh, features for these models. First of all, there is a non-zero scalar and isotropic inertia. So the body potential would not be zero in these models. Uh, before this, uh, we had this talk about the uh, lensing effect. And uh, actually, we, it is common to consider that any deviation from this equality is associated with modified uh, models of inflation. but uh, in presence of, uh, I mean, uh, interaction terms that are coming from uh, any uh, fields, but scalar fields would lead to this uh, uh, scalar and isotropic uh, tensor. And then this system has a sizable tensor to scalar ratio, and uh, there are some. Uh, and parity odd interaction in the tensor perturbation, which leads to chiral gravitational waves, and also the systems uh, generally violate the Lyes bound. And then the, the, we have the violation of the consistency relation um, in our system. Uh, I only have, I mean, uh, actually, uh, uh, from these things, uh, the most robust uh, features are from the tensor perturbation. So uh, let me focus on the tensor perturbation in the second part of my talk. So if you perturb your metric around the FRW, you would have uh, this term, which are the famous gravitational wave terms, and I'm only considering the tensor perturbations. And then uh, here, uh, if you have just standard scalar fields, this uh, delta phi uh, ju is just a scalar term, so it won't have any tensor perturbations. But here we have a gauge field as well, and it has some um, tensor uh, fluctuations for itself. And because of uh, this tensor uh, fluctuation, it uh, contribute to the uh, tensor parts of the anisotropic stress, and it would mo modify the uh, field equation of the gravitational wa waves like this. So let me just intuitively tell you what are the effects of this uh, new terms. As I told you before, uh, uh, this term uh, there are some parity odd terms, and there are also another interaction. I just keep these two two bonds. Uh, because of this um, parity odd interaction, then I cannot uh, uh, actually uh, diagonalize my system in terms of uh, plus and cross uh, polarizations of the gravitational wave. But I need to use the I, I need to write the system in terms of right-handed and left-handed polarization, circular polarization, and uh, because the contribution of these two terms are different for the uh, different polarization of gravitational wave, then uh, uh, the, uh, I mean, the, the evolution of the right-handed and left-handed polarization would be different. And in order to be more precise here, for example, we have this right-handed and left-handed solutions for a, uh, for a specific uh, model of uh, inflation involving gauge fields. And if I zoom in on these uh, superhorizon scales, 
Here, you can see the right-handed and left-handed polarizations um, are different after horizon crossing. And uh, for instance, in this specific setup, the right-handed polarization gets some kinds of enhancement. And it leads to parity odd uh, correlations of uh, EB and uh, TB to be non-zero in this setups. And OK. Uh, so, I'm sorry, wait. Uh -huh. And then let me just uh, uh, emphasize that in this system, uh, the right, so the right-handed and left-handed polarization are not equal to each other anymore. And uh, inflationary models involving non-abelian gauge fields uh, generate intrinsic chiral gravitational waves. So this leads me to the third part of my talk, which is uh, which I'm going to talk about the uh, leptogenesis scenario based in these models. As you know, our observable uh, universe is highly matter dominated. So, I mean, as far as we see, our uh, universe is made of matter, and um, there are no, uh, I mean, there are no that much uh, antimatter in our universe. And uh, we can formulate this, uh, actually, to uh, this uh, asymmetry by this eta parameter, which is of the order 10 to minus 10. So for something like more than uh, 50 years, this uh, asymmetry between matter and antimatter was, was a mystery for uh, physics. And uh, of course, uh, we expect that uh, Big Bang generate matter and antimatter with the same rate. So uh, neither standard model of particle physics nor general relativity cannot uh, give us any uh, answer why this is the case that we uh, uh, actually observe this asymmetry. And so we need a dynamical uh, approach that uh, starting from a uh, totally uh, um, symmetric uh, initial condition gives us this asymmetry, uh, which is called baryogenesis. But within the particle physics setup, it's easier to generate it first in the leptin sector and then um, transform it to the baryon sector, the so-called leptogenesis. But uh, the standard approach of uh, leptogenesis is to is uh, actually to modify the standard model by adding some massive right-handed neutrinos, which after they decay, generate some initial left or, uh, lepton asymmetry. So in the standard setup, we need to uh, actually uh, some physics beyond standard model. And uh, they usually happen after inflationary error because the source of parity violation in this system systems are not active during inflation, so they usually happen after inflation. Uh, but then uh, there is this um, nice scenario, gravital leptogenesis, by Alexander Peskin and Sheikh Jabari. They actually proposed a, a scenario of leptogenesis, which is actually happening during inflation and within the, within the standard model of particle physics. So they, know, they don't add any uh, kinds of uh, right-handed neutrinos uh, in the scenario. So uh, the idea is that uh, using chiral gravitational waves and by means of gravitational anomaly in the standard model, they find a net lepton number uh, density. So, so here, the point is that uh, after talking about all this, remember that uh, inflationary models involving non-abelian gauge field generate uh, intrinsic chiral gravitational waves. So I don't, OK. I don't need to add any, uh, anything in this setup to generate chiral gravitational wave. It's for free. So let us use this uh, present to <laughs> make some left number density. So, uh, the gravitational anomaly in, um, uh, in the standard models actually uh, give up uh, these anomaly in lepton number, lepton number currents in terms of this parity odd interaction of um, 
gravita um, gravitational part, the so-called uh, gravitational Chern-Simon interaction. And as far as the number of the, uh, the difference between right-handed and left-handed uh, uh, leptons are different, which is different in the standard model, then that would give uh, a non, uh, if you can uh, actually generate a non-zero R, R tilde R, then you can uh, find a uh, non-zero net, um, net uh, uh, left to a number. But the point is that if you start from uh, GR with, uh, and just write these um, gravitational waves with any interaction, then uh, for the, uh, it would be zero because there's no source of parity in, in your setup. But here, uh, okay, so, so here I write this uh, net uh, left to a number in terms of this integral, and as you see, uh, it's uh, proportional to the difference of right-handed and left-handed polarizations, which, uh, yeah. So again, in uh, the inflation in models with non-abelian gauge field, this term is automatically non-zero. So it be, uh, leads to a uh, lepton number. And let me just show you briefly. This is a uh, right-handed and left-handed polarization of gravitational waves. And as you see, there is this different, uh, I mean, there is a, a, the sign of the right-handed and left-handed polarizations are different, so they are slightly different with each other. And then this leads to a net lump number. I summarize it here. And as you see, it's proportional to this psi, which was the source of parity violation in our system. So let me summarize here. So I... I uh, told you that it's possible to have inflationary models involving non-abelian gauge fields, um, and they respect the isotropy and homogeneity of the FRW background. And then um, uh, the presence of non-abelian gauge fields during inflation leads to the following robust prediction that can uh, lead to sizable tensor to scalar ratio, which is uh, almost impossible for uh, inflationary models with uh, only scalar fields. And then we have uh, uh, intrinsic chiral gravitational waves and parity odd correlations, uh, which has uh, interesting observational consequences. And uh, then uh, the, the system generally violates the lice bound. So um, with a um, small subplank and field value, we can have sizable tensor to scalar ratio. And uh, we also uh, have the violation of the consistency relation. And then at the end, I uh, present a leptogenesis. I, I showed that it's possible to uh, make leptogenesis uh, scenarios based on uh, using uh, inflationary models involving non-abelian gauge fields, which are uh, leptogenesis scenarios during inflation and uh, uh, without any extensions of the standard model of particle physics. And 